Do, 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 do. Okay, Amos 6, but before that, let's go to Isaiah 22, and we'll show you the sin of football. Especially if I'm not allowed to watch it. <laughs> Three verses in here. It uh, looks like a gang tackle. Isaiah 22, verse 17. 18, 19. This is a judgment, actually, that the Lord's going to put on Saudi Arabia and Tyre and Sidon. He said, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity and will surely cover thee. He will surely violently turn, thee and, to turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. And I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. Tackle them. That drive thee, that's what uh, often they put the... Um, big guys on a blocking dummy and the, the coach would say drive, drive, drive so that's uh, where it's at okay, that's enough for that okay yeah Amos 6 Amos 6 Brother Paul had a wonderful experience with an apostate, so got to deal with one of those guys, and it's always kind of fun to deal with those guys, especially when you could basically tell you what they're going to say before they say it. <laughs> so maybe if you want to ask his experience, it'd be interesting. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I thank you for your words, and Lord, I do pray you'd help us to honor your words, help us to be faithful to them. Lord, please help us to see what happened to Israel and what's happened to them. Unfortunately, it's going to happen in our country because all nations that forget God shall be brought to hell. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to be the few, the remnant that uh, tries to faithfully serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, chapter 6. Remember that Amos was a country boy uh, and he, he uh, prophesied, I don't know how long, uh, it's a brief prophecy uh, against the Israelites, the ten northern tribes before Assyria or Assyria came in and conquered them, uh, became uh, subjects under them, lost uh, their land, lost a lot of stuff, and they became slaves in some sort. And so, uh, again, Amos and many of the prophets in the Old Testament primarily spoke against the apostasy of the Jewish uh, Judaism. And secondarily, they would uh, mention the apathy and or the anarchy that's in the, in the court structure, the judge in the political structure. So you'll find some things in here about the uh, political structure that was wrong. And, and Israel, again, is an example to all nations. What happened to Israel will happen to all nations. When they, as a people, try to serve God, then God would bring blessings to them as a people. And when they uh, apostatize, then God would uh, curse them as a nation. Okay, and that, that's, that's almost an absolute rule, Old Testament and New Testament, where in the Old Testament, when a believer followed the laws or rules of Judaism, then God would bless him uh, materially. Now, that part has changed in the New Testament, Okay, where that's not a guarantee in the New Testament, where it pretty much could have been expected under the old. But nationally speaking, when a, a, big, a, a good number of people in a society, in a nation, do follow the ways of the Lord, the Lord seems to apply blessings to them corporately. And the, the true, it is also true on the other side of the coin. It's interesting, we hear so much about Haiti in the news and how they get hammered so much. Earthquakes and things like that. Why is it we don't hear the Dominican Republic? It is a, another nation on the same island, and it's not a big island. And if you study governments, the, the, Republic, the Dominican Republic's government is more Christian-oriented be it, I know there's Catholic as far as a lot of Catholic Catholicism, but still the basic structure, 
does have a semblance of Christianity, biblical Christianity. And Haiti, that one guy that just came back in Haiti, and a, a, an avowed Buddhist. And that country has just got voodoo, and it's, it's as a nation, they've actually made pacts officially with Satan. And then what's the Lord do? He just hammers them. Why do they get the earthquakes and it really hammers them, but the country on the other side doesn't? And so uh, that's what we're going to see as far as with America and with, with uh, Israel. Now, here's the sad thing about this, and it obviously is sad, but chapter 6, verse 1, here's how he starts off this chapter. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. And trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. Okay, to be at ease. When a soldier's told to, you know, at ease, you know, relax. Not be so stiff and so original, you know, not be vigilant. This idea of this verse, now the Samaria, the mountain of Samaria, this is the ten northern tribes of Israel, house of Israel. They're called the chief of nations here. That was the first nation God chose to be his son. So they are an example to all nations. But what's being spoken here, woe to them who are at ease. These are people in Israel who have trusted their nation, who are relaxed in their, in their nation, thinking that everything is hunky-dory, everything's fine, the economy's going to be fine. They're not vigilant. They're not like a soldier as far as a soldier being vigilant, being alert. They're at ease. They're comfortable in the society of Israel. And the sad thing, that is the majority of people. They have no clue that their country is at a very vulnerable stage and their country is facing judgment. And you know the sad thing, that's where a lot of Americans are. Oh, they think the, the, government, the news media, the economy's getting better, it's getting better, it's getting better. You know, car sales are up, house sales, you know, things are getting, it, Obama has saved us, our economy. You know, and he's only spent half of the stimulus package. Oh, just think about all the wonderful things that we have ahead of us. That's what people are thinking in this country. And the average American, especially in the inner cities, don't realize that if the semis, the trucks, stop running, in less than five days, those cities will be under mass hysteria. Three to five days, they'd be rioting, killing in the streets. Now, we've not seen this you know, nationwide in our country. You've seen it locally, like in Los Angeles, when they were protested, you know, the Rodney King stuff. But there have been individual nations that the bankers have tested. Argentina, about four or five years ago. Recently, Greece. Iceland. Where, again, we are very vulnerable because our money system is at fiat currency. And anytime the bankers want to just pull the plug, they can there was accounts back in the Great Depression day. And people often talk about the Great Depression, but what's not talked about the Great Depression is what caused it. People say, well, the interest rates just got so high and the money supply got so low. Yeah, but who determines that? Who decides that? Well, the economy. No, it isn't. It's the international bankers that decide that. Men. Men decide that. And these men would take, if they wanted to convince somebody in government positions, they, back in those days, they would actually take them to Wall Street and say, watch this and see what we can do. And that thing was crashing and people were jumping from the stuff. See the kind of power we got? You see, and, and the average American hasn't a clue that that's the vulnerability we we're at. Now, uh, you know, personally, I... I enjoy having a nice economy and enjoy, you know, having the blessings we have. And I would love to see it continue like that. But uh, again, we are very vulnerable. And it's not saying that you have to live in fear and all that stuff. You know, one great lesson of Y2K is you realize how little prepared people are. 
I mean, as, as prepared as you tried to be, but as little as we were prepared, really, when you look at it in the long run. And the thing is, is the idea is if a person does have some preparation, at least knows what to do, that is the time of your greatest ministry. People will be desperate. And when they're desperate, that's when they start thinking about God. So it's not, not really, a, it, it's, not, it's an unknown time for many, but it's a time where you could actually influence people's lives more than now. Now people are too comfortable. When people are comfortable, they're not interested in God. That's why Amos pronounces this judgment. Woe to them that are at ease. They're not vigilant. They're not trusting in God. Notice what they're trusting in. Verse 1, trusting in the mountain of Samaria. That's what they're trusting in. Oh, my bank account, the economy, the government, and all this stuff. Okay, then he says, here's what he says. Pass ye unto Calne and see. Now, we don't know these cities. This city was a city that, that was founded by Nimrod. And from thence go ye to Hamath the Great. Okay, that's in Lebanon. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Now, that one, possibly you'd know that one. That's where Goliath's hometown. Be they better than these kingdoms, or their border greater than your border? Ye that put far away the evil day, and cause the seed of violence to come near. Now, this seat of violence, he is referring this to the local governing structures. Because that's how they operate, is by violence. What are the political people doing? Verse 4, they lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall. Okay, they're laying down and eating. These are, these are beds that were used to recline while eating. This is when Jesus was at the Lord's Supper. And it says that John leaned upon him and it's like his head's on his chest or his breast there. Okay, that's, that's the kind of couch that they had. Verse 5, they chant to the song of the vials and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. Now, theirs isn't like David to the point where David's music was intended to praise God. Theirs was just to feel good, you know, get their jollies. Okay, verse 6, that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. They're not grieved. They don't care for the affliction of the people. It's like many of the kings were eating in their homes in luxury while the people are starving to death. All they think is about themselves. This is like your leaders in China or any of the leaders in North Korea, any of the communist or Islamic countries where they're living in luxury, where they got gold for their bathtub fixtures and the people are starving to death. And Dubai, this multi-billion dollar place, just look up Dubai. That was built by slave labor. And where is the United Nations, you know, investigating the human rights violations of the Muslims? They're not going to say a word about it. If that took place by Israelites or by America, you know they'd be screaming on that stuff. Where is America screaming about the, the rich Saudis where they take three-year-old children, boys, and strap them in a camels and they sit there and watch these camels racing? What a thing. What a dumb camel race. You know, and they claim they got laws where it only 16-year-olds and do it. And parents actually sell their children into this mess. You see, it, the Bible tells us that there's slavery in the tribulation time period. In Revelation chapter 18. And so they're not grieved by it. And I'm not saying if you hear these accounts that you ought to live your life in grief and sorrow. I mean, because of all the media, you know, we could see all sorts of suffering throughout the world. Some of it's fake. Put on. Try to get money out of you. Okay, but yet, 
It says, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 1.18 that a man of knowledge with, which with, with much knowledge is grief. Because you see the trouble that's going to be taking place. The problems. Verse 7, paragraph Mark, he says, Therefore. Okay, so the first six verses, these are the people who are living at ease, trusting that everything's just going to be fine and hunky-dory. Verse 7, Therefore now shall they go captive with the first that go captive. And the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. They're not going to be uh, exempt from this. Not at all. The Lord God hath sworn by himself. When God makes an oath, that is unnegotiable. That is going to take place. The Lord God hath sworn by himself. They, thus saith the Lord... The God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob. The excellency is referring to the political leaders. You know, often they'll say to the king, Your excellency in our country. You know, they say that often to monarchs. His excellency. In, in America, since it's not a monarch, it's more of an oligarchy, they refer to the congressman honorable. Honorable such and such. In the religious realm, the Catholic Church will be, you know, the most holy, or the Reverend Right Most Holy, or the Reverend Reverend Most Holy High Holy. I mean, they get them way up there. Okay, and so these all these are all titles of nobility. He, the Lord says, "I abhor the excellency of Jacob, and I hate and and hate his palaces." There's our politicals, political structure. God hates that. How did they get their wealth? By theft. Yes, it's legal, but it's theft. Doesn't make it right. Just because something's legal doesn't make it right. Therefore, will I deliver up the city with all that is therein. And when these things take place, it's the city folk that gets hit hardest. Okay, where when something like this takes place, Matt, it is best to live around small town in the country where those types of folk tend to team up with each other, you know, and they, they can at least got a gun and protect themselves, okay, or have some sort of food uh, stuffs. But even, even a lot of times, you, you know, go to some of these country folks, a lot of them, you know, just got one freezer and they don't got much there, okay, and because people have been conditioned to these things. All of us have been. You know, it's nice. It's a blessing to get it. Just, oh, we need this and that. Let's go to the store. And there it is. It's all over the place. It's amazing when you can just walk into stores and it's just stocked full. And that's a great blessing. But again, you know, we are living on a very short leash there. So he's, this is what the Lord said. I abhor this. Verse 10, he says, it shall come to pass if there remain 10 men in one house that they shall die. Not going to escape from it. Now, of course, this is Israel. And this did take place, but it was about 70 years later. Okay, and I'm sure Amos had people, well, you've been saying that for a long time. You know, and again, it's the long suffering of God. Verse 10, and a man's uncle shall take him up, and he that burneth him to bring out the bones out of the house and shall say unto him that is by the sides of the house, Is there yet any with thee? And he shall say, No. Then shall he say, Hold thy tongue, for we may not make mention of the name of the Lord. During those times, you have to be very, very careful what you say. Verse 11, For behold, the Lord commandeth, and he will smite the great house with breaches and the little house with clefts. Shall horses run upon the rock? Will one plow there with oxen? You see the illustrations that he gives because he knows the country, and that's the illustration he gives. The city person reads it. What's he talking about? Okay, it says, For ye have turned judgment into gall, and the fruit of righteousness in the hemlock. A bitter plant. And this is a bitter, bitter message. It's a very, uh, it's a very, um, Sad message, but it's a message that needs to be delivered because they are going to face judgment. Now, maybe, maybe some of them paid attention to this, and maybe that's why it was delayed 70 years. You see, when Daniel delivered his judgment to Nebuchadnezzar, 
that was delayed a year. And maybe these prophets like Josiah, when Josiah had the revival going on in 1 Kings, and when they found that copy of the Bible or the scroll, the Torah in the temple, and they started reading it, and they started reading all the judgments, and it scared Josiah, and he asked God about that, and they had a great revival. You see, people they say, all oh, this negative talk, you're just going to discourage people. Yeah, but maybe it'll wake them up, too. Do you think a doctor shouldn't tell his patient he's going to have, he's going to can, he's got cancer, going to die? Shouldn't he say that? Shouldn't he give him that drastic message? Jan and mom went to a place yesterday and they heard about this lady who was going to die of cancer. Four weeks? She, gave, she was given four weeks? Something like that. Four weeks, six, seven weeks? Months. Six weeks. Okay, she was given six weeks to live, so she hired a chef. I guess she wanted to go out of style if she's going to die. But he cooked her some healthy food, and he ended up cooking for her for four years. Given six weeks to live, she made it four years. After four years, she decided, there's enough of his time, I'm just going to go back the way I ate. She was dead in four days. Went back to her white castle and, you know, and the sliders and all that stuff. Now, you said, what did it do? You say, well, did that, you know, maybe she was going to die in four days. And eat. Yeah, but it held it off. It held it off. And that's often what happens when we learn about, when we learn about some possible judgment or some possible problems, it often wakes people up and they change. They do something about it. And so you, we don't know until eternity when God reveals what, what these messages do to people. So here he said this about 70 years before. And he had other prophets prophesying. So verse 13, it says, Ye, ye which rejoice in a thing of naught, ye which rejoice in a thing of naught. Now, it's enjoyable to watch the sports, you know, Bears and Packers, but you know, it's a thing of naught. I doubt it that when these guys hit the judgment, you know, they're going to say, well, I had 15 tackles in that game, Lord, you know, and the angels oh, I'm impressed. You know, and us, you know, compared to the people who lived before the flood with the, the capabilities they had and everything, with you know, and all, all, all our great feats, you know, the Lord in heaven, brother. Just phenomenal. But still, you know, we still enjoy it and all that stuff, but still... He said, ye which rejoice in a thing that is not, which say, have we not taken to us horns by our own strength? Okay, the horns by our own strength, horns generally uh, uh, symbolize uh, political power. Okay, have we not taken to us horns by our own strength? Uh, but behold, I will raise up against you a nation. I, God, will raise up against you. A nation. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, the God of hosts. And they shall afflict you from the entering in of Hamath, Hemath unto the rivers of the wilderness. Now, because we have the benefit of history, that nation was known to be Assyria. That nation did come in. That was the nation that Nehemiah, not Nehemiah, that uh, Jonah was told to go preach at, the Ninevites, the capital of that nation, Nineveh. He did not, let's see, Amos, about 800 B.C., let's see what date I got for Jonah, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Jonah was about 10 years prior to that. So Jonah could see that the Israelites were heading for trouble. And God said to Jonah, go preach to them people. He didn't want to do it. He had a sneaky suspicion that God was going to use them to punish his people. And so, of course, we know that God put him uh, in a situation where he didn't have much of a choice. And he went and preached to them, and they had a great revival. Citywide revival, entire city, everybody. And then the next book is a book that uh, about 100 years later where 
they were preached at again, and it didn't seem like the second time around they paid attention. That time they got judged. So this Assyrian nation rose to power for one reason and one reason only. To punish Israelites. That's why God rose them to power. And so uh, they did come in, and they did uh, put it on them. Okay, and then the next chapter. Thus said the Lord God, show, uh, show, thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth, and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. Now, these are pests, going to eat the crop right when it's time to harvest. Now, who did that? The Lord did that. That's a judgment. That's a judgment pl placed upon a nation. So when this happens, food prices go up. Now notice it says, after the king's mowings. The king's mowing are, will be refer to the people who are paid and hired by the king to take care of all his property. This was forewarned in 1 Samuel chapter 8 when the uh, children of Israel uh, told Samuel, we want a king like other nations. Okay, why do you want a king? Because we want a king so he can go fight our battles for us. Okay, he says, why don't you fight your own battles? We want a king because other nations have a king. So we want a king. He said, okay. Uh, uh, and God says, go ahead and give in to him. Let him have a king. But before you do that, tell him what's going to happen. And so, okay, this king's going to take your boys, he's going to take your girls, he's going to put the boys in your army, he's going to take your girls and put them as cooks, and he's going to take a tenth of your money. Now, in America, we would love it if they only took a tenth of our money. That'd be a step up in our country. <laughs> okay, and then he warned them, and then God gave him a king, and then here comes Saul. And then all these kings build great kingdoms. They, you know, they build uh, properties for themselves, get property for help themselves, and they got to hire people. And that's doing the king's mowings. So he's taking advantage of it. Verse 2, it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, what are they eating grass for? Barley green, that's what that is. Healthy barley green. <laughs> I think they're hungry. Man, you really got to be hard up to eat something like that. And it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, then I said, O oh Lord God, forgive. So actually, they're starving to death. Plants have been, the grasshoppers have ate the plants, destroyed the crops. Food prices have skyrocketed. They're hungry. What's happened? It got their attention. Lord God, forgive us. I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. The Lord repented for this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. You see, this is an endless cycle with the Israelites as a nation. Got right with God, God blessed them. They got out of fellowship with God, God started hitting them here, cursing them here. They'd get right with God, God blessed them. They'd, fall out, they'd get wrong with God, God cursed them. They'd back and forth, back and never ending cycle. Just a constant thing. God would warn them, I'm going to judge you, I'm going to judge you. Okay, okay, we'll get right with you. They get right, and then, then they get blessed. And then, God, and then they get out of fellowship with God, the prosperity, they become at ease. And God sends them prophets, you're going to get it, you're going to get it, you know, and all that stuff. And then it happens. You see, that the, I, if you call it a mistake, the mistake that Jonah made was that he said, 40 days Nineveh shall be destroyed. He put a time limit on it. Now, when God gives an absolute time limit, okay. But when he said 40 days, then if it shall be destroyed, it wasn't destroyed in 40 days. It made Jonah look like a false prophet. And that was probably one reason why he didn't want to go preach to them. And then that 40 days turned into almost 100 years. And a lot of times in this stipulation, you know, in the stipulation, we, you know, yes, you can see the judgment is imminent. But you also can see that God can repent when man repents. And so therefore judgment is pushed off and things like that. And that's how the thing often operates. And it looks like, you know, oh, we've heard all this before, but it's just inevitable. 
So I said, the Lord repented for this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. Verse uh, 4, paragraph mark. Thus saith the Lord God, or thus hath the Lord God showed unto me. And behold, the Lord God called to contend by fire. And it devoured the great deep and did eat up a part. What is that? The great deep is usually a reference to the universe. Okay, he contended, he caused a contention. Lightning, I don't know. Then said I, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. The Lord repented for this. This also shall not be, saith the Lord God. Again, the Lord gave a warning. People heeded the warning. And then God backed off from the judgment. And this, again, is a vicious cycle. Okay, verse 7. This is the only occurrence of a plumb line in the Bible. And it, plumb lines aren't used much these days. Uh, but that's necessary if you're going to build a log house. A level doesn't work on a log. It just don't work. So a plumb line. What is a plumb line? Then, then he said, showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made, it, made by a plumb line. With a plumb line in his hand, the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then, he, then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Okay, a plumb line, uh, what's used today is a level. Okay, so you got the bubble and the level. And that shows you if a wall is straight or not. Okay, what we had to use in our house uh, is a plumb line. A plumb line is a string where the strings hang up real tall, the strings high, and you've got a heavy weight at the bottom, and then that thing comes straight down. And then you set that like you put out, you know, I put a two by four on top of the log and set it out away from the log so that the plumb line can come straight down, and then you've got to stand back, and then you've got to get the plumb line to go right in the center of the log so that the log is straight up and down. Okay, that's the way you have to do it with the log house with a plumb line. The idea of a plumb line is, is the standard is at the top, the standard is God, and it comes straight down. Then you can see. Now, the only drawback is on a windy day. The windy day will push the plumb line. So then you put a five-gallon bucket, fill it with water, and put the plumb bob in the bucket. And that way it can't blow the plumb line. Set the bucket right where you want it, and then you can still get a center on it that way. But you see, a plumb line is... The Bible way of what we call a level. And the level or standard that we have is our God. The standard starts in heaven and he drops the string down and the weight is at the bottom. And then you can measure to see if something is straight. The standard here in this plumb line, the standard obviously is the Lord. So Amos understood what a plumb line was. And this is often how God teaches us. God teaches you and I truths by our personal experiences in life. Whatever your background, whatever you did prior to what you were saved or prior to you wanted to fellowship with the Lord, you know, do something for the Lord. God will take your experiences and use them for his benefit. I don't care where you got, went to school. You know, I don't care what about your background, what it was. God can take those experiences and then teach you things about him and his word by those experiences. Okay, and so it's not a waste. A lot of times people feel like, oh, I went to Grace College for two years. What a waste. No, it wasn't. I got a wife from there. That's a good deal. You see, and so, yeah, I could, I, and I went to Howell's Innes for three years, and I realized, you know, I don't agree doctrine with a lot of things I do, but I learned a lot of good things. And, you know, I, I, back then, you know, I didn't know anything about the Bible viewpoint, didn't know anything about anything. And for me, it was, it, it was a good experience, but also I'm not limited by that experience. And when I, you know, encourage others to go there, that's their choice, wherever God leads people. See, but you could take, you know, the good out of anything. You know, we went to Colorado Springs and it turned out bad, you know, as far as the way we left. But I learned a lot of good things there. 
develop some good relationships with some folks and still try to keep in contact with a few of them. Okay, but some of them have gone their way. And God can use these things in our past and show us things about him. And that's the great blessing of it. So God is using what Amos knows. What does he know? You know, gather sycamore fruit, country boy. He knows a plumb line. He knows what a plumb line's about. And so God is using that for an illustration to him. And the Lord said, then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. And I will not again pass by them anymore. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate. And the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Okay, the high places. The high places generally, generally where the uh, secret societies will be operating. You know, worshiping Nimrod, worshiping the god Ra, worshiping, you know, Baal in their groves, kissing and hugging the trees as they run around worshiping the god Molech, a 400 or 40 foot statue in the woods, an owl. Hey, here, you got to go to Bohemian Grove to find that. That's the high places. Okay, that's the, that will usually be with the secret societies, the political figures. God said, I'm going to make that desolate. The sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. That sanctuary, that's the Judaism. That's where the common people went to their temple. So I'm going to lay that waste. And I'm going to rise against the house of Jeroboam. Okay, Jeroboam, cousin of Rehoboam. Rehoboam got the two southern tribes. Jeroboam took the ten northern tribes. Jeroboam set uh, that um, calf worshiping up there so that the uh, ten northern tribes wouldn't go down to Jerusalem because he's afraid he's going to lose some folks down there. Okay, Jeroboam was prophesied against by, in 1 Kings 13. So that's that character. It says, I think 13 times, I think, where it says that Jeroboam caused the people to sin, this character. And so he said, I'm going to rise. Okay, so verse 9, you got he's hitting the secret societies, the political structure. He's hitting the common people, the common religious structure. And then he's hitting the political guys again. The cause of it, Jeroboam. Okay, hit him with the sword. Now verse 10 down to 17 is an interesting little conversation. And you can get quite a bit out of this little conversation. It says, then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. Okay, Amaziah. Bethel, house of God. This guy is bought and paid for. This guy is in cahoots with the king. He is following the king's wishes. So Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, okay, this is the religious structure going to the civil structure, trying to nail Amos. Trying to, get, trying to shut this guy up. Tell this guy to shut up. He's out in the streets. He's down by the courthouse holding a Bible verse sign. Tell him that's a nuisance to society. You know, charge him with, with um, disorderly conduct. You know, he, just go after him, king. And of course, what he accuses him of is conspiracy. He's a conspirator against the government. You know, the conspiracy, that's what Rush Limbaugh mocks. If you call Rush Bow and mention a conspiracy, oh, he's, you're a nutcase, you're a wacko. Yeah, the Illuminati, yes, the Council on Foreign Relations. Rush, just go to New York, it's just down the street from you, you know, fly up there in your fancy plane and go to the Council on Foreign Relations and read what they say. You see? I think Rush is bought and paid for. You see, but yet he still hammers these guys, and that's a good thing, I suppose. But he says, Amoth has conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. Oh, what a thin-skinned little sissy. He's just speaking words. What's your problem? Must be affecting your wallet. For thus Amoth saith, Jeroboam shall die but a sword. Well, he just said that in verse 9. That's what the Lord said. Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely 
be led away captive out of their own land. That's what the Lord said. The Lord said that, verse 8 and verse 9. Amos is just quoting the Lord. Also Amos I said on, or Amaziah said on Amos. Now he's talking to him. He said, O thou seer. Now that idea of calling him a seer is, is, a, is a mockery. Because back in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9, seer had become a word that was out of, out of commonplace. The word seer had been replaced in society by the word prophet. The seer would have been, quote, the archaic word. That's that King James word. Where prophet would have been the modern word. Now the Bible gives the pattern of that is when you have an archaic word, the Bible pattern is use the words, keep the word in a context, but write the definition or explain what it is. So the Bible has seer, somebody who sees the future, and a prophet, somebody who knows the future. So when Amaziah says to Amos, oh thou seer, uh, he's one of them King James guys. You see, that's, that's the implication. It's the same spirit. Even though we know he didn't have a King James Bible. Okay, so that's the spirit. Where Amaziah would have been, you know, a Babylonian Talmud guy. Amos would have been a Masoretic text guy. O thou seer, go flee thee away in the land of Judah. Head south. Get out of here. Go down to Judah and there eat bread and prophesy there. But prophesy not again anymore at Bethel. Bethel, the house of God. Why? For it is the king's chapel. It's the king's court. What do you mean the king's chapel and the king's court? Is he, is he running? Oh, he's got their tax exempt status through the IRS. It's under the king's authority. That's what he's talking about. So how does Amos respond? Then answered Amos, Amos said to Amos, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me up as I followed a flock. And the Lord said unto me, go prophesy unto my people Israel. And he probably said other words. But that's what the Lord said. And he probably said something like, and to be quite honest with you, pal, I'd rather be back by the sheep than with you idiots. You know, at least, you know, they got a little more brains than you, Amaziah. But he says, go prophesy to my people of Israel. That's what God told him to do. He said, I'm just doing what the Lord told me to do. And now, now notice his very loving, sweet, kind remarks that it says to this guy. Now, therefore, hear thou the word of the Lord. Notice it doesn't stop him. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel. Drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus saith the Lord. Pal, what's going to happen to you? Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city. Thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword. And thy land shall be divided by line. And thou shalt die in a polluted land. And Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. He probably smiled and said, now have a good day. What a way to talk to somebody. But that's what the Lord told him to do. And it's been interesting to watch Amaziah's eyes at that time when he heard this. <laughs> how, how dare you talk? Do you know I have so many degrees? So do I, 98.6. <laughs> it's funny, these people, there's a, I can't remember the story, where it's located, but there's, a woman goes to Elijah, Elisha, and he is just pronouncing judgment, 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 and then he interrupts himself, he says, but what? And it's like when he's laying it down hard on this lady, you can hear this lady in the background saying, what, but, 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 and he goes, but What? They're not used to be talked straight to. These people aren't used to that. You see, and the reason why is because they've been coddled. And it's good for them to hear something like this. Okay, hey, we got through two chapters there. And the bears are still losing. Anybody checking? <laughs> not yet, huh? <laughs> what? That's what I said. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Okie dokie, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for your words. And Lord, I do pray you'd help us to uh, be faithful to your words. Thank you for this testimony of Amos. And Lord, I do pray you'd just help us to honor your words. In Jesus' name, amen.